All right, uh, thank you all for coming to the uh, Minecraft uh, Breaking the Rules of VR uh, session. I'm Soren Hannibal. I am the lead programmer on the AR and VR uh, Minecraft team. And today I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work we've done in, in VR and the decisions we've made and what we've learned. So we're going to cover the design overview of what we said before we were starting on all of this how the actual development went, some of the things we've heard from the community, and then a short snippet about some of the things we are talking about doing in the future. So um, as a, to start with the design, before we started on all of this, um, we had a number of goals for what we wanted Minecraft in VR to be. Um, most important for us was we wanted this to stay true to Minecraft. It had to be the full Minecraft experience with all the game modes, all the features, we had to find a way to support all of that. A key part of Minecraft is the um, ability to play with your friends across devices, and we wanted to keep on extending that. And we wanted to make sure that this is not just a one-off, we make a version and ship it and then uh, let it sit on and get abandoned. So we wanted to keep on doing updates. Whenever we update the regular version, then we wanted to also update this. Um, the VR versions. Um, one of the other things about Minecraft is that people tend to play for a really long time. Um, and we wanted to be sure to support that you could play in VR for an extended period. We wanted everybody to be able to play for extended periods. Those are some of the design goals we had. And then we had, um, we had the privilege to um, be able to spend the amount of time to make it as good as we could. We didn't need to rush to ship something as soon as possible. Uh, VR is really, it's a long, uh, it's a long poll. We want to make sure that it's going to be around 5, 10, 20 years. And so therefore, there's no need to just get a broken version out just to have something out as soon as possible. So when you do a VR development traditionally, well, as traditionally as, as you can say for an industry that's as new as it is. There's a lot of uh, general rules nowadays. There is um, about, you shouldn't just port the existing game over to VR. You sh uh, that is gonna give a n uncomfortable experience. First person games, like some of the worst kind of games you can do play in VR. Uh, you can't really play VR for a very long time. You can't have a lot of UI because it doesn't feel, it, it breaks the immersion. So those are some of the things that we heard very early on. Um, it's it's kind of common knowledge to, to all of you guys, I'm sure. And so we knew we wanted to, to try to see how far can we get even with uh, breaking pretty much every one of these rules. So what we have to do was just really put a lot of effort into this. Um, and I'm putting this slide up because in case there are people that have a regular game and they want to just put out a VR version, it's not something you just do very quickly. We have at least four years of programming time on it on our side uh, um, at Mojang and at Microsoft. And this doesn't count. Probably even longer test time we've spent on it, design. And it also doesn't count the fact that uh, Carmack actually wrote the first version of Gear VR that was kind of a, a fully functioning uh, alpha version. So all of that time was spent just to get a version out. So we, we spent a lot of time publishing, and we spent about six to nine months from it was functioning until we actually were ready to ship something that we were proud of. So about the development, uh, we started, uh, we took a step-by-step -step approach. And the first step was to implement VR comfort controls. Those were, it's a kind of commonly known uh, steps, right? Nowadays is the, uh, the step turning, like, instead of doing this, the smooth turning, to do it gradually when you use a right stick to turn. Um, we changed all the movement to be linearized. Uh, removed all of the things that really you don't do in VR, like uh, change the FOV and the camera bobbing when you're swimming or when you're running. 
the, the jumping code was, uh, was changed dramatically as well. Um, so one interesting bit about the jumping code, because we want this to work in VR uh, together with the non-VR titles, all of this is actually, um, in VR, you still see, I mean, in, when you play on other machines, you still see the player do a full arc, uh, a jump when they jump from step to step. But when you play locally, it actually corrects for, for the movement by doing a, um, doing a smoothed out uh, linear, um, linear jump. The first version that uh, John Carmack did was a completely linear jump, but that felt like it broke the feeling too much, so we implemented it, I think, three steps uh, piecewise linear um, jumping, and that felt like a good enough compromise. It's not quite as, uh, as smooth as a regular jump, but it still felt good enough to be Minecraft. But doing all of this work was still not enough to, to re meet our goal of being able to play for a really long time. So some people can play really well with, with first-person controls, with the VR uh, con comfort options on. Some people can even play without the VR comfort, but not everybody. So our alternative was we implemented what we call the living room. It's, it's kind of a, um, you sit in a chair, you play on a TV on screen, um, out in front of you like a big screen TV. It's a regular 2D mode, not even 3D. It doesn't have any head tracking on actual TV, so it's the Minecraft everybody already knows. We made it so people can, can switch at any time back and forth. Um, so you can go into VR, into immersive mode as we call it, to, to get the full VR experience. When it becomes too overwhelming and you get tired or you get uncomfortable, you can go back into the living room and keep on playing. It's very important for when you're playing multiplayer with your friends and you don't have to just drop out after 10 minutes. Um, and actually, it also proved to be a really cool moment. Uh, we made the interpolation between the, the immersive mode and the, uh, the living room mode be almost as if you're entering a portal when you go into the VR. It's, you see the TV open up and surround you. And it, it, gives us the first uh, wow moment that people get in Minecraft. Uh, we, had, we chose to start in TV mode because we want everybody to learn about this is, a, this is a relaxing place that you can play for a while, and also because it gives you the stepping stone into the immersive mode. Just felt like a really cool experience. So after we did this, we went on and started polishing. There was a lot of little things we have done um, the first one was uh, we found out music actually helped a lot for VR comfort. The Minecraft music is very mellow and peaceful. We found out one of our testers could play for a lot longer when he had music on in his headphones. At this time, Minecraft in, uh, on pocket uh, code Android and iOS did not use um, music because it increased the download size too much. But for Gear VR, because it made such a difference, we actually decided to in include it in there. Um, we also added a lot of different options in for different control methods. We don't exactly know what everybody likes and what everybody's used to yet, so we're kind of doing something that's, uh, that's more common in the PC world, I guess not so common on, on phones, to let users try things out and choose it themselves. So. And it seems like that is very useful, especially because when you, when you have all the, the movement in the world, when you're moving around with your left stick, it's not so much, oh, movement in itself can be uncomfortable, but especially movement you don't expect can be uncomfortable. So we left as many of these options in so people can choose the, the comfort modes that they feel are natu more natural for them. Um, so we, of course, did a lot of usability and comfort testing. I think we did about a total of 10 rounds. We made sure to separate out when are we doing usability, as in is option A or option B better, um, or does it feel better, and is it actually more comfortable? 
And, and it's super important for us when we did all of these to have separate people that test each of the configurations. You can't just have someone try version A and then try version B and see do they get comfortable or uncomfortable or not. Because like, if you're uncomfortable, it's, good. it's going to keep on getting worse throughout the day. So we did lots of Kleenex, uh, Kleenex testing here. Um, it, is, it takes a long time, but it's really worth it. So we also came up with a couple of other uh, control methods. Uh, we came, came up with one that, that we call wheel turning. That is my preferred way to play with uh, the right stick of the controller to turn, rather than holding your stick in to turn over time, whether it's uh, with um, stepwise or it's smooth. Then the, v the wheel turning, for me, means I can play for much longer. What it does is, because you don't need the, the right stick to look up and down, you only need it to turn on one angle. We kind of changed the right stick into a wheel that you turn around like this. And simply by when you push the stick to a side and you turn it, we measure how many degrees do you, did you turn on the stick. And then that's how many degrees you turn as a character. It means, or it feels like that means that when you are turning, uh, turning your stick, you have an feel for how far your character is going to turn. You quickly um, get much more of a sense of, sense of how far do you need to turn your, with your hand. And you can also turn around much faster. And to me, that means that you don't have that constant turning that, um, that is really one of the most uh, uncomfortable experiences in VR. So uh, we also decided to implement mouse and keyboard controls. I know that's not that common in VR, but we did that mostly because a lot of people in, that play Minecraft are really familiar with those controls. And it seems like the more familiar you are with the controls, the, the better an experience you have. So while it's uncomfortable for some people, you can't really look as, around as much when you have your hand out in front of you. But for some people, it's a much better experience. A lot of people in our office actually started to play with, with this. So we also did a lot of work uh, to minimize eye strain. So there's two things that make you uncomfortable in VR. There's, there's the um, movement can be very uh, discomforting. And then there's eye strain when your eye gets signals that it can't really process or there's, there's too much motion going on. One, the first thing we did was actually um, in, because Minecraft has no bilinear filtering on, then you see every single pixel super sharp. Um, Anti-aliasing is usually the thing people use to have the edges be smooth between polygons. But that doesn't help us when you have uh, large polygons with lots of very sharp uh, uh, texels. So it's not really a problem in the regular Minecraft. But in VR Minecraft, your head always moves around a tiny little bit, which means every single texel flickers a lot. So we implemented a per-texel anti-aliasing solution in our shader that's super expensive, but really is worth the cost. Um, we made some changes to, the, to how we render caves. In Minecraft, when you go into a cave, it's very dark, but it's not black, which means that you can always just see your way through very dark caves. But in VR, when it's very dark, it, you really strain your eyes a lot. So we just instead chose to make it completely black. Um, it means that you have to have your torches with you. But it really, um, it really means that when you place down a torch, you can see easily. And when you don't have any torches, you, you back the hell away. So we also had some issues with the C buffer ordering. Um, in the regular version, everything is drawn in 2D. And the hand is drawn on top of everything. That's fine in 2D, but in 3D, when you see your hand, if you go all the way up to a block, you walk into the block, and your hand is sticking through it, but it's drawn on top, it feels really weird. So we had to change it so your hand actually clips into the wall. It sounds like it wouldn't feel as good, but it really feels much more natural, because hey, you, you know your hand is inside a wall. Of course, you, that's not a, a thing you want to, a situation you want to get into, but it, at least you understand what's happening. We also changed every time you had like a fire effect or a portal transition effect. Instead of it being an effect that's drawn on top of the screen, change it to be a cube that's drawn around you in, in uh, world space around you. 
So as you're looking around, you can, you can see the box of fire. Uh, it feels very Minecrafty, but it also feels much more VR. So we did another interesting trick with, uh, with the UI. Minecraft has a lot of UI, a lot of menus. Um, and there's no way we can disable that, because half of the fun in Minecraft is going in, uh, crafting things, brewing things. There's all kinds of things you can do. So one of the issues is you can bring those menus up wherever you are. If you're staring at, into a wall, it's, it should show up. And you want it to be at a comfortable distance. So what we did instead was we looked at how, what is your eye, your gaze vector? What is it looking at? It's looking at the wall right here. Well, this is the depth you're looking at. So we take the whole view, transform it into a monoscopic, kind of at, at the depth that you're looking at. Um, and there's a little hitch when that happens, but it means that your eyes are not straining at that time. Um, so it's something that people may not exactly understand what's happening, but they have a better experience. We also did some tricks on particles and entities for how to clip them. A, a lot of those little, uh, little things. So for the UI rendering, um, on the Rift and on Gear VR, we're doing slightly different things. And for the Rift, it's rendering to a texture um, and then drawing into the world as a single quad. And, and it's especially important for the HUD. Uh, we have the HUD kind of floating around in front of you. And if that draws on top, but it's kind of it's inside the wall, it wouldn't feel good. So what we do instead is draw it twice, draw it with, uh, with C buffer off and then C buffer on. No, the other way around. Um, one with 25% alpha and one with 100% uh, with, uh, alpha, which means that the bits that are sticking through the, the world is drawn at, um, as grayed out, and the bits that are not sticking out are not, are not grayed out. It feels like a much better solution. At least you understand why it's grayed out. Um, so that's, that's a compromise we were pretty happy with. Now, for Gear VR, we actually couldn't do that. Um, for Gear VR, we're using a separate uh, layer in uh, the Oculus APIs. It, using a separate layer meant we just, the text is so much more readable. Um, this is the one tip for anyone working on Gear VR. If you have UI, render it to a separate layer, if at all possible. It meant, but it meant that we wouldn't be able to do this composition into the world ourselves. So we had to rely on, um, on just drawing it always on top. It's a, it's a compromise that, that we can accept at this point. It's, it's probably the best thing we can do. Um, there's another thing about the Gear VR. Uh, it has a function for each layer to choose whether you want uh, to correct for the chromatic aberration. If at all you can enable it, you should try, because the text becomes so much more readable. We unfortunately can't do it in, in uh, Minecraft without changing all of our UI around. And um, I don't think that that's something, that's an investment we can't do at this time. But if you can do that on your title, you should really try to do that. The other benefit of having the UI rendered to a separate layer means we can render that at a much lower frame rate. Uh, for Minecraft, the code the simulation runs at 20 hertz, and the rendering runs at 60 hertz on, on Gear VR, 90 on Rift. But rendering the UI only at 20 hertz really saved us a lot of time, because while UI sounds like something that should be fast to draw, it, it just isn't for us. Speaking of the HUD, this was actually one of the first things we made that felt like a really polished uh, experience is um, the first version we, we tried of um, placing the HUD was to have it kind of fixed in your display everywhere you're looking. Um, but it fell out of place. So we made an alternative, which is the, um, the HUD kind of floats around. As you're looking around, it kind of tries to fly in and, and be where, you, where your head is. But the, but the HUD is really floating in, uh, in the world. So. It's something, some of us like it, some of us don't. I know uh, John Carmack really didn't like it, especially because when your frame rate drops, you can see this, um, 
this floating around is not smooth. So while time warp corrects for for frame drops as you're looking around, it doesn't correct for what we have no way of putting acceleration into the time warp uh, to make the HUD flow around uh, smoothly. But this was another one of the examples of we, we create the option, let people choose what they want, and we will later on figure out once everybody gets familiar with VR, we can figure out what is the best practice, and then we can, can disable options at that time. So we did a lot of uh, performance optimizations. Uh, so our version was based off of our Android and iOS code base, um, which we also using for Windows 10. So it already was running on the target platforms that we were aiming for. Um, but there was still a lot of optimizations we had to do and a lot of choices we had to make. One of the first ones was when you launch the, the Gear VR version, um, we actually run in monoscopic by default. We don't know how many of people's devices, how well people's devices are going to run. Um, so we wanted to be conservative, and we set it to monoscopic. We also felt like it actually was a pretty good experience. For people that are not VR experts, they can't necessarily tell the difference when they begin. They have a great experience um, in that. Like Once you become much more into the media and you try to uh, understand VR much more, you want those features on, possibly. But for us, it wasn't, it wasn't something we needed uh, right away. It was more important to leave the options so that as you launch a game for the first time, you have a good experience. Um, one trick with a UI, when you render the UI on Gear VR to a separate layer, make sure to crop when you, when you submit the layer to, uh, uh, to the time warp. Because when our HUD was this small, by default, it was rendering the whole screen, or drawing that to the whole screen, just wasting cycles. Um, so we did, for Rift, we did um, some tricks to render both eyes in a single render pass. We don't really have performance issues on Rift, but it was just something we, we had already been working on when we were doing the HoloLens version, so it was pretty straightforward for us to, to re-enable that. Um, we also, we were very conservative with the render distance options we were giving people um, because we want to make sure that no matter which options you choose, we want you to, to try to have as good an experience as possible. We did the hack that whenever people enable stereoscopic, we multiply the maximum render distance by 0.7 or something like that uh, because we assume that, and, and historically we've seen that users tend to just go into the option and slide everything to the right and that can kill performance. So uh, some of the uh, work we did technically was um, we made sure when we started up to, to write a clear abstraction layer for everything that was related to the, the, the VR devices and the libraries. It's kind of how engines have for a long time been doing OpenGL and DirectX ex abstracting that out into a small set of files. We've done the same thing with the Gear VR, um, Oculus Rift, and HoloLens code. So it means that most people don't even have to worry about any of the VR code when they, when they write games. It just, it's all hidden from them. Um, and then our flat mode, our desktop mode, is just really, it's just a simple, another, another implementation of the class uh, that's simply um, abstracting everything away. It's a very simple version. Um, so that's one of the, the really good decisions we made architecturally very early on. Another decision we made that have paid off in spades is we planned out what are all the spaces and transforms that you have to worry about. Um, instead of the traditional uh, camera view um, projection, there's about six different spaces if you take in camera view um, world position, um, screen, like that, that's, a, that's a lot of different matrices that you have to consider. Writing a, a single system that dealt with all the matrices and dealt with the different game modes as well really made it much more, um, much easier for everyone on the team to, to write code. Um, so we were able to, to write functions that simply say, I want to know 
what is the hand position in world space if you're play, oh, considering that you're currently playing in um, immersive mode. And it, it, a single function call gives me the hand position in the world space. Rather than having to go in and get a matrix and multiply it on, oh, I have to get this matrix, multiply it on, um, we cleaned up so much code by implementing this one system. And another thing we did with this was um, because we support multiple different um, gameplay modes, we have the uh, immersive mode, which is full VR. We have the TV mode, rendered to a texture, drawn, in, uh, drawn on the screen. And then we also, from HoloLens, we had uh, table mode, uh, which is playing on a tabletop mode. All of those have a different uh, uh, transform on anchor position in the world and it's transformed into the, the game world. By saying, I want to get the hand position transformed into the uh, into, uh, game world space in the, in the table mode, by using those uh, single function like that, you save yourself a lot of time. So we also figured out with v doing all of this that there was a lot of little things that were kind of broken, slightly broken, in Minecraft that we had never really noticed. Every single flower was floating about five centimeters above the ground. We just had never seen it because you'd never get close to them in the regular mode. Um, same with the games. Uh, the, uh, the worlds in Minecraft are rendered in, in chunks of 16 by 16 by 16 meters. Um, sometimes there were little gaps between them. In the regular game, we didn't really see it because it was just a couple of pixel flickering. In VR, when you are in a dark cave, it's completely black, and you see a line of blue pixels, it breaks everything. So we had to go in and polish all of those things. And same with the tiny little amount of uh, lines of pixels at the edges of the sheep. You, it's <laughs> frustrating. But there are so many little things. You, you can only play your game, and then you, you're going to learn that have all of your mistakes. They're just going to be in your face, and you want to fix them. Um, and then. For some reason, when we were drawing, drawing the Sky Dome, um, because the Sky Dome was too far away, someone had gone in at one point and multiplied the depth range with some factor, which meant that once we were drawing everything for real, um, the, the Sky Dome was drawn kind of halfway through the world instead of all the way out at the end. Those are the kind of hacks you just have to undo. And so finally, after we are done with this, we're not actually done, because every time we keep on making new features, um, we need to support VR. Whenever anyone implements a new enemy, make sure that it still works in VR. But more importantly, any time the player movement changes or there's new, um, new things you can ride or new ways you can move, you really need to check it in VR. Um, so we've taken the approach of making sure that everybody no doesn't necessarily need to know how to program in, uh, the, in VR. Uh, for, for Minecraft, but everybody needs to know what are the, th the hot spots that you need to watch out for um, and warn us before you actually implement it so we can try it out. Um, one of the first things we tried after we shipped the first VR version uh, was uh, riding on uh, pigs. In Minecraft, if you ride a pig, it just starts going in random directions. That is not very comfortable, but uh, those are the kind of things that we just have to always go in and look at what can we do to, to make it better. Um, always watch your frame rate. We haven't been super thorough with that in the past on Minecraft, but we, we're getting much more uh, aggressive on that. And always test everything, because all of a sudden, something just behaves really weird, even though the regular game works just fine. So we have a constant cost from now on for probably as long as we are going to keep on shipping this Minecraft code base to make sure that VR runs on both of our devices, um, Gear VR and Oculus Rift. So this is great. We shipped the game, and then uh, now people are starting to play the game. The first thing we hear is the turning is broken. Uh, it seems like the VR turning, it's VR turning is really something that feels unnatural to a lot of people, especially if you've played a lot of games in the past. Uh, so we wanted to do everything we can to make sure that people knew we're doing this on purpose. It actually helps. 
we try to put in, or we have put in a menu. The very first thing you see when you launch into the game is a big pop-up right in your face that says, make uh, you can choose between VR controls and classic controls. And it's basically trying to say that classic controls are not at all good for VR. Um, we still see a lot of people choosing classic controls. It's because they don't necessarily like the feel of VR. We need to do more, I think, to communicate to users that VR controls really help. Give it a chance. Get used to it. While it's not comfortable right away, you quickly forget about it, and you can play for much longer. Take the time to learn it. But we don't have a solution for that yet. Um, so when we shipped the TV, we, we're really happy with how the TV, uh, TV and the living room mode turned out. A very first review we got was, it's just playing on a TV, one star. Um, so we had tried everything we could to communicate on the, on the splash screen when you launch the game, says, make sure to take breaks and, and touch, your, um, touch your headset to toggle to, uh, to immersive mode and back in. But people don't read the warning screens. We also have, when you're playing on the TV, uh, if, the, if the TV is right in front of you, right below it, it says, touch your headset to toggle to immersive mode. I don't know why not everybody's seeing that, but, um, but maybe it's because it's outside the TV. People are so conditioned to when there's a TV, you look at that. I'm, I'm guessing here. But we, we've changed it so that the text stays up for forever instead of leaving it for a short period of time. I think a lot of people, maybe it, it's, there's a lot to take in when you go into VR. And I think as someone that's played the game for a long time, we didn't maybe anticipate how, how much there is for, for people that are just starting it. Um, the next thing was some of the comments we saw on, for example, Reddit about the render distance is so, so short, just go and, and move it to the maximum. Hey, and if you go into the options file, you can set it even higher. <laughs> this, it is something that people are, are making these things. And yes, they, it looks better. You can see further. And maybe users are not as uh, perceptive to when the frame rate drops but they don't understand why they can't play for longer. So there's more work we need to do here to make sure that if the frame rate drops, tell people what's happening, tell people why this is why you can't play for as long, and let them set the settings lower, or maybe we even go in and, and lower it for them. And the final thing is we've done a lot of demos recently. Um, we just had Minecon, um, which is um, like 12,000 people coming in just to see Minecraft. Oculus had a lot of stations set up where they, they were demoing to a lot, of, a lot of Minecraft fans, but also a lot of Minecraft fans' parents that had never held a controller in their hand. And we have a, we're using pretty much all the buttons. Controllers themselves are not simple for people that don't know uh, how to use a controller. When you put a headset on, you forget where the buttons are. Um, and when you tell people, just use your left stick to move, they kind of get shocked when they, when they start to move around. They don't know what to expect. Um, and I think a lot of people that were not familiar with controllers had more VR discomfort than, uh, than people that really played the game. So we, we need to figure out how we can make sure that everybody can, can have a good experience. This is, for a lot of people, this is going to be the first time they try VR. They, their parents, or the kids drag the parents, you know, friends come over and, and try this. And they might not get a good experience. So some of the things I've been thinking about is maybe we should just leave you in the, uh, leave you in the living room for a while until you've proven you can actually move around. Uh, do things to block you until you've proven yourself, which is a very not Minecraft way of thinking. Minecraft is very much about exploring and letting you do things yourself. So we feel very unsure about what to do here, but we're still trying to figure this out. 
so um, what comes next? Now we've shipped the Gear VR version in about six months ago, I think, five months ago. The Rift version a couple of months ago. And there's still more work happening. So I'm, I'm not going to be announcing anything or talking about a lot of new features. Um, but the first thing that we are definitely working on is the Oculus Touch that is coming out at, at some point. Um, <laughs> so um, we're working on it. We're doing the next Minecraft release uh, in about two weeks. Um, it's not going to support Oculus Touch. It was never supposed to uh, support Oculus Touch for this release. Uh, we sent out a press release that, that said it was going to do that um, because we were gathering a lot of things we were working on and not actually when they were done. So it's going to come at some point after that release. That's all I can say about that. Um, there's a lot more work we can do with, with comfort experiments. There's a lot of render tricks. There's a lot of um, movement uh, techniques we can try. We have, we're not sure what's going to work and what's not. And we really don't like announcing anything when, it, when you don't know if something's going to work. Uh, so I'm just going to say that this is something we really want to do a lot of work on and do a lot of testing on. And doing user research takes so long, so I don't know when we would, would have anything for here. Um, so a couple of the ideas of what, what we want to do for in, internal teams um, that we haven't done yet, but that we think will really help out is uh, for people that play the regular version, uh, have an overlay that, sh uh, that shows on screen when movement would make you uncomfortable. Right now, regular people can change, uh, or regular devs can change how the player moves around without knowing what the impact should be. It should be possible for us to measure how, when, the, when is acceleration changing, and then make something that turns the screen uh, gradually more and more red and until it kills the app or something. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways we can communicate uh, with everyone without having to sit into everything. Um, the other one is um, we currently don't have a way for regular devs to simulate the VR modes. And we think it could be really cool um, if you can have the VR and living room mode work. Because we've done our platform ex abstraction the way we could, we should be able to create a VR platform that just doesn't read, uh, that uses mouse and keyboard to read the input for the headset, but otherwise behaves just like, um, just like a Rift, for example. So those are some of the things we really want to do. There's a lot more on our wish list. We'll see how many other things we'll get to.